Human beings are a species that lived on this earth. We've existed genetically the same for about 100,000 years. 100,000 years. We have not changed our genome. We've not evolved. We're the same. You could have taken human beings that have lived 100,000 years ago, if you had them now, and shaved them, washed them, and put them in this room. You wouldn't know that they were cavemen. But the way they evolved, the environment in which they lived, determined what they were like. The environment in which human beings lived 100,000 years ago is what your genetics, your biology, was designed to live for. You were designed to live in the Horn of Africa. Now, this is a map of the world, and the areas that are shaded white are the parts of the world where all other primate, ape and monkey type species, live in their natural environment. And I point out to you, we are the naked ape. We are a primate species. And if we didn't have technology to have shelter and clothing, we, you and I, could not survive north of Florida. We wouldn't live if the oranges were freezing, so would we. And look at the part of the world where the first human beings originated. It is very equatorial, high area of sunshine. This is where our genetics was selected to be. Now, there are very few Stone Age people left on this earth, and there were some on the islands that were near India during the tsunami, and these are very rare pictures. You can't get many of them. And if I could, what I would wish to do would be to get blood samples from these people and measure them and find out what is the natural level of vitamin D for human beings. Now, during that tsunami, Indian Coast Guard helicopters wanted to find out how are these people doing, and you can see the welcome there. There's no way you're going to get a blood sample from these people. And you can see what he's wearing, and you can see the sunshine he's living in. Now, 100,000 years ago, it is thought that human species migrated outward from Africa, and it was at least around 20,000 years ago that the first human beings crossed the Bering Strait and started to populate North and South America. But in the old world, the part that you see on the left side of that diagram, there's a few interesting things that happen. But first, think about anthropology, the way human beings were designed to be, and think, is it natural for me, as I stand up here, to be covering 95% of my vitamin D skin form, skin vitamin D forming surface? Does that make sense? Might there be a health consequence? This is a graph that shows uh, various areas of the world where anthropologists have measured skin color. They do it by skin reflectance, and the higher the skin reflectance, the, more, the lighter the skin. Now, in those areas of the old world, like Africa or India, that are nearer to the equator, the skin colors are very black. And as people migrated northward toward Finland or Norway or Germany, um, skin colors got lighter. And likewise, as people migrated toward New Zealand, skin colors somehow were selected for. Skin color is doing something. How could that happen? Well, we call it a process of natural selection. It's where nature, the environment where people live, is doing something to them. It's choosing them. And you might ask, how can this happen? Well, firstly, I have to point out, whether you have black skin or white skin, you are able to make the same amount of vitamin D. However, a white skin person like me, if I go out into the sun, by the time 20 minutes is up, I've made my maximum amount of vitamin D. Longer in the sun's doing me no good. On the other hand, a very black skinned person has to be out in the sun for about two hours to make the same amount. Sounds logical. So they have the same ability to make vitamin D and different exposure requirements. Now, where would this thing, how could white skin have happened? Well, what happens is when you've got too little vitamin D as you're growing up, you have a bone disease called rickets. The calcium isn't being absorbed well enough to have the body have enough calcium to put into the bones. Your bones are soft. Now, what you get is a picture like the left side of that where the bones start bending, and you may have seen people like that. 
they had rickets as a child and it wasn't treated properly. But the worst thing, what's worse for a woman is not the long bones, but the pelvis itself. What happens with rickets or osteomalacia is that the pelvic opening gets so small, the woman can't have a baby. In other words, in ancient times, as families migrated out of Africa, if the skin color was not light enough, they didn't have enough vitamin D, the pelvis was too small, and that was the end of the genetic line, end of the family. However, families that had lighter skin colors could survive because they could have babies. That process is called natural selection. Now let's ask, how much vitamin D should people have? And this is um, something out of a review article I did about six years ago. Basically, I'm looking at, at the far left, hospital pers port personnel in Puerto Rico, it's south of Florida. Their blood levels are higher than 80 nanomoles per liter. Okay, this, just think of a number. This is the, the ruler that we use for vitamin D. The blood level has to be, in this case, normal, 80 nanomoles per liter. Farmers had it at just over 120, and there are two publications on lifeguards. Lifeguards probably live in an environment similar to the you know, Paleolithic people, and their blood levels were closer to 150 nanomoles per liter. Note that these are averages. There's a spread around those numbers. So you say, okay, well, I can't move down to Florida, and I'm here in Calgary, and I don't want to take pills. Let's say I'm going to go to suntan parlors. Now, if, if the sun lamp does produce ultraviolet light B, here's what happens. And every set of bars here you see is a publication that I've pulled out of the literature. These are published peer-reviewed studies, and there's at least about almost a dozen of them, but the blue lines represent what happened or what the levels were in people before they started going to the suntan parlor, and the red ones are what happened afterwards. And what I'm pointing out here is that when people go to the suntan and get a full body exposure of ultraviolet light, their blood levels are consistently higher than 80. You might ask in a little while, what good is that? Well, I'll show you. Now, I got some blood samples sent to me from Nigeria of two-year-old children. Mostly Africans don't, do wear a lot of clothes. People living in Africa are dressed 95% of their skin surface covered, but infants are usually in diapers and outside. And with that, they get blood levels like a lifeguard. Well, what I've got down there is our Mount Sinai hospital personnel. That's our normal range a few years ago for our lab, about 40. That's Canadians, and you're probably that, like that. The way these figures are, I just have to point out, what you see here is uh, it's called a box plot. And the box itself, if you had a whole bunch of people, if you had 100 people, the middle 50 of them are encompassed. They fit into the numbers that the box shows there. Okay. And the top and the bottom of what's called whiskers, the lines, they show you the highest and the lowest numbers. That's how the box plots work. So you can just see, sort of see what's normal. So to summarize what I've done up to this point, all studies of healthy apes and monkeys that we have, and there are a lot of publications on primates other than human beings, all of the healthy apes and monkeys that have ever been published have blood vitamin D levels higher than 80 nanomoles per liter. And all of the studies where they actually give ultraviolet light, because humans make vitamin D naturally with ultraviolet light, their blood levels are higher than 80. And in Toronto during the winter, that's our normal range. Half the people have levels around 40 and maybe almost up to 80, but very few, almost nobody during the winter in Canada has a blood level at 80 nanomoles per liter. The most vitamin D that you can buy in the drugstore without a prescription is a thousand international units. And what we did was effectively a safety study. We wanted to see, well, what happens with a thousand international units? And it took them from that 40 number up to about oh, just almost 70 nanomoles per liter. And then 4,000 units, which officially, it's officially toxic. This is poison. It's what the official pharmacy books say is poison. If you go to the pharmacist and they're being an ethical pharmacist giving you the straight goods that they're officially supposed to tell you, 4,000 units will cause your blood calcium to go too high. Well, 4,000 units brought the level maybe a little bit higher than 80 and it didn't bring the vitamin D anywhere near what it would have been if people had gone to a suntan parlor. So here's a rule of thumb. A glass of milk contains 100 international units of vitamin D. It's fortified milk in Canada. That's enough 
to raise your blood vitamin D by two and a half nanomoles per liter. Two and a half. A multivitamin contains 400 international units of vitamin D. A multivitamin can raise your blood level. If you take it religiously and every day, it'll raise your blood level by 10 nanomoles per liter. 10. If you want 80, you're not going to take 10 multivitamins. These are the official um, guidelines for vitamin D. And what we have is people younger than 50, from the moment they're born through pregnancy and until they're 50 years of age, the official re recommendation is effectively like two glasses of milk, 200 international units of vitamin D. You should be furious. Your multivitamin contains 400 international units. That's okay for up to 70 years of age. And officially, the government says people older than 70 should be taking 600 international units of vitamin D. Now, if you take your high-potency geriatric vitamin, there is not one product, not one that you can buy that even has the official amount of vitamin D in it for you. If you're older than 70, like, it's infuriating. Nothing has changed. And we're starting to get a lot of science, which I want to show you. Um, by the way, the new way of um, presenting the numbers, the new units, you know, like the SI, the metric version of um, vitamin intakes is in micrograms per day. We're talking five micrograms. It's tiny, tiny, a millionth, five millionths of a gram is what's recommended for most of you in the room. Complete baloney. It's complete nonsense. So again, we're sitting down there. And obviously, we're not sitting at our typewriters like that unless we're very alone and with the curtains drawn. But our levels are there. And how? what are we going to do with it? And what's the so what? Well, what are the so what's? Okay. Now, this thing I told you about, natural selection, how did it work? Natural selection is nature designed to make it possible for you to have healthy babies. Nature optimizes you to have a baby, but if there's a disease that happens in you after your childbearing years, if there is a disease like osteoporosis that happens after your age 50, what does nature care? If there's a disease that happens in you like cancer, it probably happens long after you've had your children. Nature might have helped us get white skin to help us survive so that our bones would be okay. But it's not necessarily the right amount to protect against cancer or diabetes or multiple sclerosis. And these are all diseases that I'm hoping to have time um, to show you that they are affected um, by vitamin D. Now, I come from the field of osteoporosis, and this is just, you know, you have to bear with me and, and follow the story through. Now, there's some very large studies that go on in the United States. There's one called National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, and they've been following more than 50,000 people, but here's a sample of about 2,500 uh, men and women who are less than 50 years of age. And along the, the horizontal part of the graph, you have the blood vitamin D level. And on the vertical side of the graph, you have bone density. It's sort of adjusted just so everybody is similar. Like black people usually have higher bone density than whites, but they did a statistical trick just to keep everything on the graph. But the point here is, if you have a survey of people and you compare their blood vitamin D level against the average bone density of the people, the higher the vitamin D level, the higher the bone density. The black and the Spanish American numbers that you see at the bottom of the graph, they kind of peter out because there are almost no statistics at that point. Now, if you uh, say, well, my average vitamin D in the winter time is 40, 